Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes. This is a lovely, rainy, cold Sunday morning here um, where Courtney and I have seen each other three times in the last like 36 hours. And we still just talked for 45 minutes before <laughs> pressing record. So in case you wondered what our relationship is like, I feel like say. That, that sums it up. I mean, like, how do we literally never run out of anything to talk about? Like, <laughs> It's actually like truly, um, I don't don't really know if I want to say a miracle, but impressive maybe. Like, yeah, we can just pull it out of our brain holes. I mean, it started with you getting into the Zoom going, hold on, I have to finish this TikTok and let me tell you about the TikTok I was watching. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, yeah, you know, and then we had to go down that rabbit hole and. Yeah, the TikTok Reddit rabbit hole is. It's, it's it's extensive. There's a TikTok Reddit? I'm sure. No, I just meant TikTok slash oh. Reddit. Okay. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, is there some like big TikTok conspiracy that I need to be informed about? I mean, if you believe that it's run by China to steal all of the American people's information and should be um, I mean, yeah, illegal. obviously. Don't we all know that? <laughs> What is that conspiracy? <laughs> um, I also love how your sister and our listener Ashton, we uh called that a few months ago about uh how she was not at Friendsgiving, but we still loved her and missed her. And we're like, it's okay, she's not gonna listen to this for three months anyway. And then she texted us this week and two months later and confirmed. So yeah. she'll hear this one, you know, this summer and <laughs> let us know. <laughs> she said she's trying to get caught up, but we'll see how caught up she truly gets. Because she's in November, she's still two months behind. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to get caught up on podcasts. Like I'm I'm struggling with all mine right now to to stay on top of them, and you know, yeah, especially if you just have like, if I have like one extra meeting in my week, I'm like, well, mm-hmm. now I'm four podcasts behind. <laughs> Yeah. Or if you like go on vacation for like a week or like a weekend or Mm -hmm. you like have people over and you're like, oh, like I would usually like listen to a podcast while doing X, Y, Z. And now, you know, so it just kind of it sets you back. You know, it does. Yeah. Well, I think we already all talked out after talking (laughs) for the last 45 minutes and then we hit record and we're like, well, there's nothing we can say on the podcast. (laughs) Exactly. Because all the things we have to chat about are not appropriate for public consumption. So, you know, you guys get the um, the very uh water edited down, condensed yes pg pc versions mm-hmm. <laughs> although over on patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes it is a little more juicy you know That's if you want to join us over there we we have a little less filter going on on those episodes we feel less like editing for patreon episodes so you might just get a little <laughs> bit more more spice over there yeah, we just we just leave it in where, versus here. Sometimes we're like, mm, maybe I should cut that. Maybe that's not appropriate for the world to know. Yeah. But yeah, um, so not a great update this week, um, as we see all too often. Um, on January 7th, Memphis police pulled over 29-year-old Tyree Nichols um, for supposed reckless driving. Seems like there is some controversy over like what did or did not happen and like some confusion and you know that sort of thing so did just want to put the supposed in there um but he did run and then police caught him and severely beat him until he was hospitalized and died three days later um also want to say it was five police officers Mm -hmm. who severely beat him yeah um so the body cam footage of this horrific murder was released this week and did lead to protests in Memphis and other parts of the country and the five police officers involved have been fired and it looks like as of the last article I read and this may change but three of them um were charged with second degree murder aggravated assault aggravated kidnapping official misconduct and official oppression so we will see where those charges go um but again as we see in the news seems like every day another black man killed by police during a traffic mm-hmm. stop like and i do want to bring up too because i'm seeing a lot of like tiktoks about this because um in this case the five officers are also black and so mm-hmm. of course this is bringing out the racists yeah. being like oh like whatever but like black lives matter like was also really a movement about police brutality and like the Mm -hmm. oppression of the police system and the power you get as a police officer and using it. And like, it is 
the whole like police system is like built on a white supremacist system. Like if you look at the history of the police. So like mm-hmm. that is like what these marches are about. So I feel like now yeah. people are trying to even more so discredit like the Black Lives Matter movement because these are five black officers. And it's like, no, like that is not the point. Like mm-hmm. it is the point that like in the police, like you get like this power Mm -hmm. And, like, you're taught, like, you can abuse it and get away with it, which is hopefully changing a lot. But Mm -hmm. um, because I know, actually, Andrew, who said he watched the footage, was like, Mm -hmm. you can hear them a thing being like, that was so awesome. That was so awesome. Okay, how are we going to cover this up? Because it's on our camera. Stuff like that, where it's like, yeah, clearly, this is a part of this system. So Mm -hmm. I just kind of want to bring that up because it is, like, a really big point at this part. Mm -hmm. part, Like, because people are going to just be idiots and be mean and try to just further like discredit black lives matter basically. Like, and that's the whole like anti-police police brutality movement is not about individual racism. Like no one is like every single like individual police officer just inside themselves is racist. And that's the issue. It's like, no, it's a systemic racism issue Mm -hmm. that allows police officers to use their power in this way against minority groups. Like, point blank like that is the issue like that is the like whole thing about like all cops and it's like it's not about your individual beliefs as a person as a police officer it's about the system that you are a part of that encourages and supports and allows this and that's where we have to make change yeah i don't know i don't it's gotta be like an overhaul or some i don't even know there are people a lot smarter than me and a lot more in tune with what needs to be done and so Mm -hmm. that's who i look to because i don't have the answers i'm not qualified (laughs) we're going to turn to the people who are smarter and better than us to know how to go very well and i will support them (laughs) very well put um yeah and if you guys have not watched the footage i have not but i've heard Mm -hmm. it is horrific so we would i mean make your own decisions but just know going into it that apparently it is very bad so yeah i i don't think I'm going to watch it. Um, yeah, same. And yeah, I just know it's it's not for me. <laughs> so on a lighter note, it's not to uh, give a little a little high before we go back into um, some very difficult topics in this episode. Um, last week, if you guys heard any random chopping, my husband decided to make coleslaw while we were recording a podcast mm-hmm. because <laughs> that is a smart idea. Um, And so Courtney and I have decided to move our recordings to the evenings after my daughter has gone to bed and my husband can retreat to playing his video games quietly (laughs) alone Mm -hmm. Um, because apparently he can't be quiet when the child is awake. Um, So we are doing our last morning recording today and my child is currently watching Frozen and singing at the top of her lungs. So if you guys hear that, I apologize and just know it should be better going forward. (laughs) I did hear that last one, actually. Yeah, (laughs) that one was... Yeah, so she's she's a lovely singer, you know, just right on pitch and like Mm -hmm. she gets it from her mom, huh? (laughs) Right. She sure does. She (laughs) definitely did not get her dad's singing abilities. (laughs) Maybe one day. Um, But yeah, we're going to we're going to move these sessions to uh, to the evening, just not this evening because the Bengals play this evening. So we're going to have to wait until, you know, which I was thinking also we do have the Super Bowl coming up. So then we're either going to have to do Saturday or a morning. again. We're going to have to adjust. But, you know. We'll figure it out, guys. We can always do a night recording. I'm a night owl, so this works great for me, (laughs) personally. (laughs) Not that we record that early, which I was like, yes, like going forward, I can sleep in on Sundays. And then my body woke me up at like 8 a.m. today. And I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. That's not what I meant. No. (laughs) That's not what I meant. (laughs) Oh, boy. So, yeah. So, that's, uh, that's all we have about that before we get into the rest of this. Yes. So, our... Resources today was a womenshistory.org article, a few National Park Service articles, Britannica.com, and Women and the American Story, uh, like New York History Organization article. Um, So February is Black History Month. So we want to take a little bit of a different approach and just like kind of highlight um, like a Black activist in history who made like a big change, um, basically, like It's not necessarily a lighter topic. We are still talking about very serious things, but this is someone in history who really, despite all odds, like tried to push the progress forward. So it might not be your traditional kidnapping murder story, but a little different here. Um, 
because I don't want to start Black History Month with just talking more about Black people being killed in history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's which, like we said, with today's update was not um, planned, yeah. but unfortunately, the police officers have other. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking that too. And I was like, mm, our like first, this is not. This has to be our uh, first update in February, is. This. Yeah. Um, but we did intentionally try to give you a more positive um, Black History Month story instead of, like already said, just telling the stories of more Black people who have been murdered, which are important stories, but we also want to highlight, you know, more positive things and achievements and progress. Yeah. And a trigger warning here, there is some discussion of lynching. So there will unfortunately be some of that. Um, So if that's something you just don't want to hear about at all, especially this month, um, completely understand. Mm -hmm. Does not hurt our feelings. Move on. We'll be good. Yes. So Ida Bell Wells was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi on June 16th, 1862. Um, She was born into slavery during the Civil War, and she was the oldest daughter of James and Lizzie Wells, and she had seven siblings. So once the war ended, Ida's parents became very active in Reconstruction era politics, um, and her parents really highly valued education and really encouraged Ida to learn as much as she could. Um, so Ida did enroll in Rust College. So Rust is a historically black liberal arts school, and it's actually only one of 10 historically black colleges and university that was founded before 1869 and is still currently operating today. Wow. So I thought that was pretty interesting to know. Yeah, definitely. So it was founded by the Freedmen's Aid Society and James Well was a part of the society as well. Um, So one article says Ida was expelled when she started a dispute with the university president, but another said she was just kind of like forced to drop out. So I don't know if she was expelled or if they did like force her to drop out because of an altercation, if she just dropped out, kind of muddled there. Mm -hmm. So in 1878, at the age of 16, she went to visit her grandparents. And when she was there, her hometown got hit with a yellow fever epidemic and her parents and her infant brother both died. So she was the oldest sibling and she was left to raise the rest of her siblings. Um, So she took a job as a teacher to make ends meet. Um, She actually had to convince a school administrator. She was 18, like kind of lie and be like, yeah, I'm 18. Like you can hire me. Like it's fine. Just because she was like, I have to support this family somehow. So in 1882, Ida moved the family to Memphis, Tennessee, where an aunt lived. Um, Her brothers found work as carpentry apprentices. And for a while, Ida continued her education at Fisk University in Nashville. So she would have to frequently take the train back and forth from Nashville to Memphis. And in May 1884, Ida had purchased a first class ticket, um, but the train crew forced her to move to the car for African-Americans. They were like, we don't care that you paid extra to have this ticket. Like you got to go to this car instead. So Ida did refuse on principle because she's like, I purchased a first class ticket. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, So the train crew eventually forced her from the train. And as she was moved, she actually bit one of the employees, which I was like, get it, girl. Just be like, go girl. (laughs) Raise hell. Raise hell. So Ida did sue the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, and she won a $500 settlement, which is actually about $15,000 today. So like, wow, quite a bit of money. Yeah. But the decision was eventually overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. So Uh, of course it was not as happy as we want it to be. So following the train incident, Ida started writing about the issues of race and politics in the South. Um, she used the name Iola um, instead of like her name. And she had quite a few articles published in black newspapers and periodicals. Um, she did later become the owner of two newspapers, which was the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight and Free Speech. Um, so Ida was still a teacher in a segregated public school. And she was like very much an open critic of the segregated schools in the city. And she was actually fired from her job in 1891 because of it. So in 1892, Ida turned her attention to white mob violence after a friend and two of his business associates were lynched. So Tom Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart had started a grocery store like in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, And this drew a lot of customers away from the white owned business store in the neighborhood. And so the white store owner and his supporters clashed with Moss, McDowell, and Stewart on multiple occasions. Like he's very mad that, you know, they opened this grocery store, his customers being taken away, you know, all of that. Which 
Can we also talk about how at this point in time, they're like, oh, no, you can't be near us. You can't. We want everything to be separate. Oh, but we'll take your money, of course. Oh, and mm-hmm. no one else can start their own business and take money away from us. Like we yeah. will, we'll, you know, be near you enough to take your money. But but other than that, like you can't be near, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. So on one night, they had to guard their store and they shot a few of the white men in the process. Um, they were arrested and taken to jail. So unfortunately, they did not have the chance to defend themselves because a lynch mob did take them from their cells and murder them. So Ida wrote articles denouncing the lynch- lynching and even risked her own life traveling through the South to learn more information like on other lynchings that were kind of similar Um, So she was really skeptical about like why black men were being lynched and decided to investigate several cases. So she did publish her findings in a pamphlet and wrote several columns in local newspapers. So she was really trying to emphasize like how whites use lynching to like get rid of black people who are acquiring wealth and property. Like I feel like a lot of the times they were like, oh, like they lynched him because he raped a white woman, stuff like that. Like they're trying to like have this like rhetoric that it's like oh we only lynch like when they attack somebody but this was like they were attacking like anyone who was black and was like getting wealth getting property like rising themselves up basically like in society like it wasn't just cut and dry like they wanted everyone to believe which we've clearly seen in the cases that we covered um, about the Election Day massacre in Florida, because that mm-hmm. town um, was very heavily populated by Black people at the time who had um, amassed, you know, land ownership and all of this. And then also in the Wilmington 10 case that we just covered last week, because they did have three city councilmen who were Black at this time in the 1800s. It's like, it's a very um, common theme here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were really just using lynching as a way to further oppress Black people. And one of her exposés about an 1892 lynching ended up enraging white locals. And a mob actually stormed her newspaper office and destroyed all of her equipment. Um, Ida was actually in New York at the time this happened, which very likely saved her life. Yeah, like there is no telling like what this white mob would have done to her if she had been present at the time. Yeah. Um, So she did decide to leave Memphis and stay up in the north. Um, And she wrote an in-depth report on lynching in America for the New York Age. Um, So this was a newspaper run by T. Thomas Fortune, who was a former slave. Um, And so she did continue on, you know, doing this work, even though her life had been threatened. And she eventually started residing in Chicago and also brought her anti-lynching campaign to the White House in 1898 and called for President McKinley to make reforms. Um, Unfortunately, at this time, no reforms were made. In 1893, Ida joined other Black leaders in calling for the boycott of the World's Columbian Exposition. So the boycotters accused the Exposition Committee of locking out Black citizens and negatively portraying the Black community. And in 1895, Ida married famous Black lawyer Ferdinand Bennett. Um, So they did have four children together, and Ida balanced motherhood as well as her activism. So she is just doing all of the things, like being the biggest badass. In the words of Beyonce, she did the damn thing. Exactly. Um, And she was also one of the first American women to keep her maiden name. Ida also traveled internationally to shed light on the lynchings happening in America. Abroad, she would openly confront white women in the suffrage movement who ignored lynching. And because of her stance, she was criticized by the suffrage movement organizations in America. Um, Because we know, unfortunately, at this time, A lot of the women's suffrage movements were not intersectional and were very, like, we support white women and white women's rights. But they didn't consider, like, the unique issues that were faced by minority women in this country. Um, So even though she was, like, criticized by these movement organizations in America, it did not deter her. And she did continue to remain active in the women's rights movements. Um, She was a founder for the National Association of Colored Women's Club which was created to address issues dealing with civil rights and women's suffrage. And in 1908, there were brutal attacks on a Black community in Springfield, Illinois, and Ida took action. In 1909, she was in Niagara Falls for the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. Um, She was considered a founder, but did cut ties with the organization because she felt that in its infancy, it lacked action-based initiatives. Ida also founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago on January 30th, 1913. Um, So the club organized women in the city to elect candidates 
who would best serve the Black community. And as president of the club, Ida was invited to march in the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., along with dozens of other members. So organizers who were afraid of offending Southern white suffragists asked women of color to march at the back of the parade. So, again, just going back to, like, Mm -hmm. we only care about white women's rights. Like, y'all, I guess you can be here, but you have to go to the back. Like, just complete lack of understanding of the issues that these other groups are facing, even more so. So Ida did refuse to march at the back of the parade and stood on the parade sidelines until the Chicago contingent of white women passed, at which point she joined the march. So the rest of the suffrage club contingent marked, marched at the back of the parade. Um, work done by Ida and the Alpha Suffrage Club played a crucial role in the victory of women's suffrage in Illinois on June 25th, 1913, with the passage of the Illinois Suffrage Act. In 1922, she supported an anti-lynching bill that went before Congress. Um, the bill did end up failing, as did all efforts to end lynching. Um, But she did continue to fight for anti-lynching reforms and raise money for women's clubs to encourage political participation. She even ran for state office herself once. And late in her career, she did focus on urban reform in the growing city of Chicago. And Ida died on March 25th, 1931, of kidney disease. In 2018, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice opened in Montgomery, Alabama to commemorate more than 4,400 Black men, women, and children lynched between 1877 and 1950. So yes, I want you to keep in mind that 1950, when many of our parents and grandparents today were alive, this this is not a far-removed issue here. Because I think that's the common rhetoric, is it's like, Well, that was just so long ago. I'm like, it's not that long ago. No. It's not that long. Not at all. And in 2020, Ida was given a Pulitzer Prize for her outstanding and courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious violence against African Americans during the era of lynching. So the Ida B. Wells Barnett House is in Chicago at 3624 South Martin Luther King Drive. And it is a private residence and not open to the public. But it is a National Historic Landmark. Um, So that is the life and all of the activism work of Ida B. Wells. Yeah, definitely just someone who had a lot at stake. I Mm -hmm. mean, you see her, like where her newspaper was and how she could have been murdered then and just like so much at stake. And she just kept pushing and fighting for like, you know, anti-lynching and women's mm-hmm. rights and black women's rights and yeah. reform and black communities and stuff like that. And she just fought, even though she did have so much at stake. Um, so we just really wanted to like highlight her. Cause like, I've heard the name Ida B. Wells, but I didn't think I've like really like heard like everything she had done. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it was just important to really like talk about her and try to not try to focus on, you know, some of these it's not a happier story because there is still lynching and Mm -hmm. oppression and everything like that, but just someone who fought so hard and is such Mm -hmm. an inspiration. Yes, definitely. So in light of the content of this week's episode and this being black history month and us just being two dumb white women who don't know anything, (laughs) who are (laughs) doing our best to try to get information out into the world. um, It does feel a little not appropriate for us to share perks of the week this week because white women do too much talking and white women do Mm -hmm. too much inserting of their own lives and opinions and thoughts and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to shut up this week. Um, Mm -hmm. So instead of perks of the week this week, um, we do encourage you to seek out black owned businesses and look to our black leaders and black organizations that help to fight the oppression that is still unfortunately continuing today. Um, And yeah, we just want to take a moment to step back and not have our voices overpower theirs. And hopefully you will be able to find your own ways to support this movement. Um, And we will try to find some good resources to like link in the show notes um, Mm -hmm. that you guys can check out and places to donate to. And please let us know if you guys have any other specific organizations um, or businesses or anything that you do want us to highlight here for the rest of black history month. 
Yeah. And please also be sure um, to not be a white. If you are listening and you're a white, don't come in and try to be a white savior. Don't try to come and cry about oppression. Like just don't do any of that. Um, Just like see how you can assist. And it literally might just be using like your white privilege to like protect people and like stand because unfortunately that is the case. Like don't, don't Mm -hmm. try to make it about yourself. Um, Do it in a way where you are supporting um, and don't try to come in and be like, these people need me. <laughs> like, yes, they, like they you... don't. Um, you just need to assist and be an ally and not mm-hmm. over try to overtake it or anything. Exactly. Like that. Exactly. Like do the work that leaders in the black community have already started and can let you know specifically how you can help and not take over and not be a leader in this fight that's not yours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and just like message us and tell us the organizations, um, maybe if you have a black activist in history or today that you think would be a good one for us to cover, let us know, you know, where to find us. We're not going to plug any of our shit here. You know where it is, you know what it is. Um, but in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee and don't commit a crime. Mm -hmm.